the time that he was killed, who was Data Hydera? Data Hydera was the co-owner and editor at the time of the Point newspaper, which was established in December 1991. And your um, testimony is that it was the state that killed him in December 2004? Yes, even before, because of course in the Gambia nobody killed anybody. Nobody had any reason to kidnap people or shoot, their, or sh or shoot people. And it was clear from his works and uh, criticisms against him, coming from the media and uh, coming from the government and the security, that actually Dera was a target. Because shortly even before his murder, I mean, we had the army, PRO, uh, complaining about, about him. Uh, they always disagree with his uh, Good Morning columns, where he, or Good Morning Mr. President columns, where he raised issues that are very pertinent and sensitive. And all this led, them to, led us to believe that uh, the regime actually hated him a lot and they were, he was being targeted for harm. And he was killed in, in brutal circumstances late in the night when he was dropping his staff. It couldn't have been anybody else there. It couldn't have been any other group. No group was in this country was kidnapping people. It could only have been state sanction. So that sent us a real signal that Obviously now we are in deep trouble because the regime will not stop at anything, even if, even if it means killing us. So that was a big turning point and it galvanized um, the media to go at least for that moment to come out and be publicly heard internationally that we really have a serious trouble. There was a march passed by the GPU and members and, and, and all the journalists, all the media had a week or two blackouts and we were not printing news blackout, we are not printing, in protest at his murder. But that, I think, was the turning point. Things got very, very bad, or even worse, I would say, from that point. And can you tell us what happened to you? Yes, I had my own experience on May the 30th, uh, 2006. Then I had already left the Observer. I was uh, BBC correspondent. I mainly sent dispatches to the BBC. Um, on the 30th, I, in the evening of the 30th May, I was driving, I had a car, I was driving around Serekunda police station. I was meeting a friend, Abdul Salam Jami, who had just returned from Canada. He was with his wife, they were shopping, and I greeted him. We were talking just by the police station in Serekunda. Um, then somebody came, and he greeted me and was waiting. He said, I was looking for you. So I continued uh, chatting with Abdul Salam. And then Salam said, well, since you have somebody already um, who wanted to talk to you, let me just take, take leave of you. Then he left with his wife. The man who came introduced himself as a policeman. I can't remember his name. He said, I've been looking for you. We have been looking for you at your home in Burfoot and other places. And how said, did he address you? Sorry. He said, Lavin Sam. He knew me uh, directly, I know. He recognized me directly. He called my name. So he said, um, we've been looking for you from Brufur. We told you went to your friend in Sukuta. We didn't know where, so I said, I just saw you here. So I said, well, I was part of the people who were looking for you, so I just came to you. I said, what is the matter? He said, let's go to the police station. We have been asked to, uh, to go for you and arrest you. So, well, they claimed they have been looking for me all along, but they got me almost without effort because I was just almost opposite the police station. So I just drove in the police station with my car. Uh, he asked me to wait until they got in touch with, I think, uh, their senior. I waited. They got somebody on the phone, and then they asked me uh, to go to Banjul with them. I chose to drive in my car. They said yes, and they joined me, and we went to Banjul. So before you proceed, you, um, you said they called someone. How many police officers arrest, um, arrested you or asked you to follow One them? One person who identified himself as CID uh, did the initial arrest from outside the police station. But when we got inside, he handed me over to orders in the station, and they called somebody else, Then I was asked to go uh, with two or three, or two of them in my car. There was a, there were other group in another car leading us. And the two police officers that were, two or three police officers in your car, did you recognize any of them? Yeah, I recognized Boto Keta very well. Uh, I didn't know the others, but I remember Boto Keta very well. And at that time, do you know what part of the police force um, Mr. Botaketa was? Botaketa was part of the uh, criminal investigations 
He actually was criminal investigation, I believe, CIDO. So you proceeded to Banju um, with these police officers. Tell us what happened. Yes, we drove straight to the police station, central police station in Banju. Um, I was taken upstairs. Uh, there were, it was about closing time. There were other policemen in the, in the rooms. I was taken to one of the offices. I overheard them saying, one of them saying, ah, but you were just asked to uh, call him for questioning. And the other one said, no, that order has changed now. They said we should get him at, uh, at all costs. I, ha I overheard them say that. So I was brought into a room which, is, which was definitely an office because I found tables, television, and papers. And I was made to sit there. I sat there for some time. And uh, one policeman came to me and said, OK, Mr. Cham, I've been asked to tell you that you will sleep here. But you will sleep at this office. And you can thank your staff because all the people related with this freedom affairs have been locked up downstairs. There are others there, they are in the cells, but you will be, you will sleep in, the, in, in this room there, in, in, in the office. That was the first time I began to know what brought me there because he mentioned freedom. And you prior to that, you hadn't been told why you were being asked to come in? Nobody told me from Serikunda, and nobody told me when I was at the police station. And when you say that that was the first time you knew it was in connection with Freedom, what do you mean by that? Well, Freedom newspaper was an online paper. It was well known around because it was very, it was the paper that carried sensitive issues, stories that you wouldn't have seen in, in local papers here, because obviously impossible to report such things. It was very popular among Gambians. People read it in the Gambia and abroad. And during that time, uh, a few days to, from my arrest, um, it was said that the editor's uh, email account was hacked and volumes and volumes of information was stolen from there and brought to NIA. And then they printed these things into volumes and all, maybe thousands and thousands of uh, papers. And they were going through these uh, papers. And everyone whose names or email address was in that paper or had communicated to the Freedom Editor would have been called. I mean, hundreds of them. That was a press, com press release that anybody whose name was mentioned, that was published in the Observer and other papers, that anybody who's mentioned in that list should report themselves to the police station. Did you find out about this information before the 30th of May, 2006, when you were arrested, or did you find out about it subsequently? I, I had the press release myself. I saw people being taken to police and reporting themselves. Apparently, what I later realized is that some people were just mere contributors, like uh, mere subscribers. Like, they would send their emails to the editor, and then, because then it was impossible to access it here. They block all access to that. It is, you, you, you really have to be an IT wizard to be able to access those, those online papers. So I think what happened was some people sending their email addresses to the editor so that when things are published, instead of them looking, it, you know, trying to connect here, it will come direct to their emails. Now, most of those people were even government officials. I mean, so when they saw the email address, they just went for everybody. And they were, you know, screening them to see who actually was a... Re I think they were looking for people who might be reporters or informants. But in the process, they took along nearly 100 people. Who was the editor of Freedom at the time? Pandey Rimbay, and he still is. You told us that by the time you got to Banjo Central Police, it was around closing time. Yes. Would that be around four, five? Ah, that was well after five to six. Around five uh, to yeah. six. In, in no time, the whole place was empty. I was left with that policeman. And when the policeman told you that you're lucky because other individuals connected to the freedom issue were taken downstairs in the cells, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, I knew, of course, freedom was very much hated by the regime. And then, like I told you, a few days previously, there was this press release that people should report themselves to the police. So I knew that if this was freedom, then, then definitely I was in serious trouble. But I didn't know how was I connected, because at the time, I have never written or even spoken to the editor at the time. So even though I really uh, wondered what has happened, but I was in no fear, because I knew I had never corresponded with the editor at the time. But all the same, I was made to sit there. I sat there, and this guy told me that it was... It's freedom of, it's, it's, it has to do with freedom newspaper. It has to do with that.
You told us that you went to Banjo Central Police with your own vehicle. Yes. And then you were essentially detained at the police station. Yes. Were any of your belongings taken? No. I had nothing on me uh, at the time, only my car keys. My, mo my mobile, of course, was confiscated from the car. The moment we stepped from the car, I was told I was under arrest, so I couldn't use the mobile phone. But you weren't told what you were being arrested for? No, I, they didn't tell me. Only that policeman who was left with me told me that uh, you will sleep here, but others connected with freedom are locked up in, in the cell below. Did he tell you why? You were being allowed to sleep there as opposed to going down in the cell? Uh, he, didn't, he didn't give me any reason. I don't know, maybe that was out of his own. Or maybe the senior man at the time before they left. Because like I told you, I overheard them saying that um, I was just meant to be called and Quexon. That I was mentioned in context, they should ask me Quexons. But then one other policeman said, no boss, that had been changed. We were asked to bring him at all costs. So I don't know whose idea was for me to sleep in that police office instead of being locked up uh, downstairs. After you were arrested, were you able to um, contact anyone, such as your family, perhaps lawyers, for instance, or any other individual? Uh, no, but uh, later in the night, the policeman told me he was going out to get something to eat. Uh, normally, he shouldn't leave. <laughs> he shouldn't leave the office. I should, he should always be by my side. But since he, know, he knew, of course, that I was upstairs, and, and, and there were people at the police station downstairs. Anyway, there are guards there. So perhaps he knew I, 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 could, I couldn't even try to go out. I wouldn't have any way to go out. He told me, okay, I'm going to find out. I'm going to get something to eat. So you stay in this office. I'll be back. That was the time I asked him, is it possible for me to use your telephone and call? He said, uh, not allowed, but I will, I will do. I'll try then I asked him to buy credit. I gave him some money to buy credit. Then I called my friend, whom I was with uh, uh, shortly before my arrest, Abdul Salam. I told him, well, you know, after you left, the man who was asking for me was actually a policeman. He arrested me, and I'm at the police station. I placed an important call to the BBC, Africa Service, because uh, uh, I was then working for the BBC. I told them that I've been arrested. I'm at the police station at the time. I, cannot st I couldn't stay long on the phone because it wasn't allowed. Then they contacted the editor at the time, I think it was Joseph Warungu, and um, they called me back to say, all right, they got, they got, they now know what's happening, but perhaps, you know, it wouldn't be nice just to broadcast, you know, to announce my ar arrest because, it, you know, it might lead them to come up with Trump, Trump, Trump charges, they may be panic, but they are going to find ways uh, to ensure that the authorities know that uh, I've, been, I've been kept there. And I think they contacted the British High Commission. Because later I, I realized that the British High Commission in Banjul was making inquiries about my whereabouts. That and was the only call I made. And then the friends told my wife, and, and that was it. And the police officer who allowed you to make that phone call, you don't recall his name? No, I think he said Dabo. I really, I really cannot recall his name. But I, think, I remember he was a Dabo. Somebody called Dabo. Can you tell us a bit about that night that you spent at the police um, station in Banjul, in that office? What was the condition like? Were you able to sleep? Were you given food to eat? Well, of course, it was an office environment. Uh, there were only a desk, chairs, uh, and I slept on the desk. I watched television a little bit. I remember it was the Roots Homecoming Festival being hosted during that week. My uh, wife or mother of Bob Marley was, was, was in town, and that was being broadcast on the television. So I watched that a little bit and went to sleep on the desk, because it was, it was only desk and chairs there. Were you given any food to eat? No, no, no. Even the policeman who went for food <laughs> didn't share it with me. <laughs> what about um, access to facilities? Were you able to go anywhere um, while you were in that office? No, no, no. I couldn't go anywhere. Only that room was, I was confined to that room. That was my, that was my home at the time and my office, so I slept there. So no access to bathroom facilities, for instance? Uh, in the morning, I was, uh, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to brush my teeth and I wanted to brush up. I was allowed to go there. there. There are toilets just nearby in the corridor. I did that and was escorted back to the office early in the morning.
Can you tell us what happened um, that morning? When I was there, the uh, policemen started coming to work. I remember the then Inspector General um, Usman Sonko came. He found me in the office and shook my hand. He greeted me by a name. Of course, he did. I, like I said, everybody knew me from television. So he called my name and shook my hand, but he didn't say anything. Uh, when I was there, the police were coming. Nobody told me anything. I was just sitting. Then Duta Kamaso came, the former National Assembly member, one of the Willie constituencies, came with, with, with the luggage. He, she apparently must have come from some journey or something. Yeah, I remember that. So what happened after um, Mrs. Duto Kam um, Kamasa arrived? Yeah, so. nothing was said to, him, to her at the time. Uh, she was just there waiting as I was waiting. Nobody told us anything until much later when uh, I didn't see her anymore. She was taken to some other place. But we met at the NIA because later that night, that evening, I was taken to the NIA. Around what time were you taken to the NIA? I should be in the evening, around the evening. When, when and I, I think it was only two or three people we found there at the time, in terms of staff. So during the day prior to being taken to the NIA, were you informed of any other information as to why you were being detained? Nobody told me anything. I was within the police. They were busy walking there. Everybody was going around. Those who recognized me were greeting me, but nobody told me anything. Were you provided with any food or access to lawyers, for instance? No, I was not given any food or lawyer. So in the evening you were taken to um, the NIA? Yes, I was taken to the NIA. Do you recall who took you to the NIA? Same police people. I remember Boto Keta was there with a couple of others. I was taken there, yes. Can you tell us what happened when you arrived at the NIA? Uh, again, I was made to sit at, uh, at the reception. Uh, that, that's, that's the reception. That's when you come to the NIA. That's the first building you come across. And it also has a sentry post uh, where somebody's always on the watch there. There, there are seats there and chairs. That's, that suddenly was the reception at the first gate. That's where I was made to sit. I sat there until nightfall. Again, you weren't told anything during that time? Nobody told me anything. What happened when nightfall arrived? Well, I, I actually recognized uh, uh, one Mohammed Haidara when he was leaving, before he came back in the night, when he was leaving, he told me, Mr. Charles, do you know what brought you here? I said, no, I had no idea. Even though I was told, I had the policeman talking about, you know, I told him I didn't, I don't know, I didn't know what brought me here. He said, you'll find out in good time. He left. So when you say Mohammed Haidara, um, do you know who he was at the time? He was deputy director of NIA. The director then was Harry Sambo. And is it Mohammed or Momodu? Mohammed Haidara. Mohammed, okay. Yeah. That's your right. Mohammed and Mohammed, Mohammed and Mohammedu sometimes, but I think Mohammed Haidara. But from Haidara what you said, he was the deputy director he of was the NIA the at the time. Of NIA. So after that conversation with him, and he told you, you will soon find out why, yes. why you're here. He left. He left. Yeah. What happened next? In the middle of the night, about 2 a.m. or something like that, somebody, I was sleeping actually, I was woke from sleep. Somebody woke me up and said, yes, come. Where were you sleeping at that point? Uh, that's, that's, uh, that reception I told you. And I followed the person. I didn't, I didn't know the person from Adam. I had never seen the person. And I followed him. Uh, then I was taken behind a building, a main building at the NIA then, and um, there was a, a, some sort of a ring, um, like, like some people put some stone boulders around a trip of sand, as you often see all around, yeah, when people are constructing something. So I was taken to that ring and placed in the middle of the ring, and suddenly I saw Tumbul Tamba. Tumbul Tamba, I recognized from him. He, is from the, he was from the State Guards, and Musa Jame, who was called Maliamugu. When you saw them, can you tell us what happened? Well, even before I actually asked anything or found out anything, blows, whips, red started falling on me. I could not understand, but I saw eight other people who were obviously drunk. From meters, you could, you can, you can, you could 
smell alcohol from their breath. I've never met them. I've never known them. And they didn't, they didn't look like they know me because, uh, uh, I mean, they were total strangers to me. But Tumbul Tamba and Musa Jame, I knew them before. They were the ones leading that torture. Can you tell us how you knew um, Tumbul Tamba and Musa Jame prior to that incident? Um, in fact, it was Tumbul I knew better than Musa. Musa, of course, I knew him as state guard, uh, and I had a lot about his reputation. He was called Malia Mungu. Um, Tumbul I knew because he was a football fan, Arsenal to be exact. He, loves, he, loved, he had loved um, Arsenal so much. In fact, he had a vehicle that he himself um, labeled Arsenal 1. Uh, that was his own, my small car, that was his own vehicle. He's, it was well recognized to be driven only by him. He rode Arsenal 1, that was his number plate. He was a good football fan. And uh, I remember when he went, one year he went to a mission to Sierra Leone or Liberia, when we were at the stadium commentating, uh, then it was African Nations qualifiers. He would call me, I would leave the commentary box to go and update him, uh, and then I would come back to the commentary. So we had that uh, relationship, all was talking about, always is football, football. So I was totally surprised when I saw him uh, as the leader of the gang who was torturing him. I was completely surprised. You were telling us about the gang of eight men yeah. who were torturing you. Yeah. Can you tell us um, what exactly they were doing and, whether, and what they were using to do it? Well, they had, a lot of them had whips, uh, like canes, which are which are obviously in robbers, because it looks like a robot chain or something. Others were using only their fists. They were stamping me from the back. They strapped my hands behind my back so I could not resist. And others were stamping on my feet, my legs, everywhere. I was bleeding everywhere, profusely, profusely bleeding. Every part of my body was bleeding. And I realized that when I go out of energy, because they were asking questions. Tumbul was asking, what did you tell, um, what were you congratulating Omar Ba for? Uh, and then, you know, why are you congratulating him? What did you tell Pandere? I told him I don't even understand what you were saying at the time. And then they, they turned out, to, then, they, then, then they went to other questions like, how much is the BBC paying you? Why do you lie? Why can't you make a report without mentioning Jammeh? Those were the questions they were asking. And I didn't have any answer because I had no clue. And then they asked me, which James? Who was James? I had no clue who was James. They, those were the questions they were asking. I had no answer because I didn't know what, what they were even talking about. But they continued the torture until when I was about to lose, I knew when I was about to lose energy and tumble will like it, like, like, like an, a leader of a band, he would, he would call them to stop and they would stop. After I regain energy, he will continue his questioning and then he will signal them and they will continue the torture. Went on like that. Then after that first session, they took me now to a room where I found two NIA officials who I recognized to be Mohammed Hydra and Nuru Seka. Perhaps just give us the titles of those two individuals and then I want to ask a few follow-up questions. Mohammed Haider is the deputy director of NIA, I told you that. Nuru Seka, I later found out, is director of operations. You told us that Tumbul Tamba was in charge of um, this group. He was. You also <laughs> mentioned Musa Jame, Malia Mungu. Yeah. And you also mentioned the eight individuals who were doing the actual beating and torturing. Yeah. Did you recognize anyone apart from those people? Only Tumul Tamba and Malia Mugo, that's uh, Musa Yame. But the rest, I didn't know them. From. How were the eight individuals dressed? Could you tell? They were not in uniform. Only Malia Mugo was in uniform. He was in full uniform. Tamba, Tumul Tamba was in tracksuit, was wearing a tracksuit. The others were dressed in different, different uh, kind of attire. Some were just putting on jeans, but they were obviously drunk. Were they dressed in the same color of attire or different colors? Green, some green, some black, but differently. There was no, they were not in uniform. There was no uniform like that. And you only, only Musa Jamme was in full uniform. You told us that they were torturing you for a period of time. Do you recall roughly how Oh, well, the first session might have lasted over 25 to 30 minutes. Because it, it went with questioning, and each time I had no answer, they will, he will signal the people to come, to come again. 
You also mentioned an Amarva as part of the questioning. They asked if you were in contact with, first you mentioned Pandari, but you also mentioned Amarva. Who was Amarva at that time? Well, Amarva was uh, my junior. He was uh, at the Delhi Observer. I, when I was editor, before I left, uh, we, we worked together. And uh, when he was here, uh, I remember, of course, he was also uh, a friend of Pandey Rimbai. Um, at the time, I didn't know the connection. At the time when they were asking this, I didn't know the connection. But they were asking me why I congratulated him and who was a James and what, why was I congratulating Omar Ba. I didn't know the connection at the time. It was later, much later than I knew actually what they were trying to find out. Omar Ba was a journalist with Osadi Daily Observer and uh, he he was known to Pandari, I know, but then at the time I didn't know the connection. It was much later when I had an announcement that Omar Wa was being sought, that anybody who, you know, who lodged him would be himself or herself in deep trouble, then I began to connect. Perhaps I, you know, was connected with Omar Ba. But at the time I didn't know what was the connection. And the last question before the break, can you tell us what kinds of injuries you sustained as a result of that torture, that first session? I, like I said, most part of my body was injured. My feet, for example, suffered a lot because they were stamping on my feet. I saw myself, my skin has been peeled up. I had wounds at my thighs, my ankles, my back, my face, my eyes were bloodshot red for a week or so. All the time, all the time I was there. In fact, it was... Uh, um, the, the lady I told you, the woman I told you about, uh, Duta Kamas, who, who act, acted in a murder way, in a murder for son. I was like, like our mother there, he took care of me. I later, she took care of me. I later saw detainees who were fellow journalists who were missing, actually, and in, in the likes of Malik Mbub, Lamin Fati. After my torture, they looked at me. I said, oh, so this is where you were? And they said, well, this, this is where we have been. I'll come to the club, that, so to speak. Thank you very much for answering my questions. We will come back to what happened after that first torture session. Thank you. Um, I hand over to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe it's time for the break. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma Council, and thank you, Mr. Cham. We'll take a 30-minute break and come back at um, 12 noon sharp. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Good afternoon, Mr. Cham. Welcome back. Thank you. I hope that you had a good break. Yeah. Prior to the break, you were telling us about um, your personal ordeal. You started by telling us that on 30th May 2006, you were arrested um, and taken to Sarakunda Police Station. Thereafter, you were taken to Banjul to Central um, Police Station where you slept, and then the next day, in the evening, you were taken to the NIA headquarters in Banjul. Correct. You then told us around 2.30 in the morning, you were escorted outside, still within the premises of the NIA, um, but outside in the yard where there was some kind of pit, and you were placed in the middle of that pit. <coughs> you were then tortured by about eight individuals whom you don't recognize, and present were Musa Jame of State Guard, um, alias, um, alias Malia Mungu, Tumbul Tamba, also State Guard, who appeared to be in charge of the torture operation. You told us that you were tortured for about 20 to 30 minutes, being beaten as well as questioned. Thereafter, you told us the injuries that you suffered. You were bleeding a lot. Um, Parts of your skin were broken, um, and thereafter you were taken back into the NIA building. You told us that you were taken to a room where you found um, deputy director of the NIA. Um, you referred to him as Mohammed Haidara, as well as Nuru Seka of the NIA, who I believe you said was the head of operations. Is that correct? Correct. So when you arrived in that room, Nuru Seka and um, Mr. Haidara were present. Yes. Who else was in that room? Tumbul Tamba and Malia Mugu came with me um, to that room. But the, 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 uh, the, uh, the rest of the torture gang were, 
were behind the doors. They didn't enter the, uh, the room. At the time, you said you were bleeding profusely and yeah. you were led into the building. Um, you must have been dripping with blood at the time, is that correct? Yes, and I remember uh, one civilian, most of the civilian staff of the NIA, uh, came with a cup or something like that, and, and he was cleaning uh, my blood from the carpets, which were stained my foot as I was going to that room. He was cleaning bl bl I mean blood from the carpets, the floor there. That was a civilian. He was not in the panel, but he too was... Uh, he could have been part of the torture, as I didn't know, but he was not in uniform anyway. He was cleaning the floor. And when, after I left, uh, too, I saw him cleaning um, where I sat in, in, in the room, the interview room. So from what you've said, you were... A person looking at you could tell that you were visibly tortured, is that correct? Yeah, it was very clear. It was very clear. I, I, uh, I mean, I had blood all over my body. I didn't even know at the time which spot, spot where I bleed. There was blood all over me. My feet were particularly very, very, very bad because I saw my skin was spilled off. Um, and it was Duta Kamaso um, who was detained along with us there who, who came and acted as a mother. He was helping me. Um, and then the other colleagues, Malik Mbu, Flamin Fati, and others were also in solidarity. That, that the middle of the night, it was uh, 2 a.m. or something like that. So I want to focus on the individuals who were in the room. Yeah. We've mentioned the four individuals who were present. And you told us the condition that you were in, and anyone would have known that you had been tortured. Tell us what happened in that room. In the interview room, Mohammed Haidra, who was leading that interview, told me that uh, it was better for me to cooperate with him or them Otherwise, these men will come back, meaning, of course, the torturers will come back. And I asked him what was his question. He repeated these things, that who was this James, and why was I congratulating Omar Bar, and was I reporting for any newspaper called the Freedom Paper? I, I didn't make any sense of what he was saying. I kept repeating that I, I actually had no idea what you were talking about. And he repeated these things that it was better for me to cooperate. And then after a while, Tamba, uh, rather, um, Maliamugu shouted in Mandinka, said, I told you that let's kill this man. They went there at the Amla. Meaning, of course, that his advice was at the beginning. He told him, I told you. That's how he put it. I told you we have to kill this man. Otherwise, he wouldn't talk. Whether that was to, to scare me or perhaps to... Um, well, he actually meant what he said, uh, I didn't know, but I was terrifically scared because I knew his reputation as a, a vicious man. I mean, if there was a Malia Mugo, there must be an Idi Amin. So uh, I knew the history of both of them. So I knew these guys, I mean, they didn't name him just out of the blue. He certainly must have earned his reputation uh, correctly by his own actions. So I was pretty scared, especially when he said I should be killed, otherwise I wouldn't have to. So if he was uh, Malia Mungu, then who, who was Idi Amin? If there was a Maliamugu, Isaac Maliamugu council was a notorious uh, general in Idi Amin's army, whom Amin himself had to confess to one of his ministers that sometimes he, Amin himself, wondered whether the man had not gone mad because of the vicious ways he handled his victims. So if there was a person in the military who had that nickname, definitely there must be an Idi Amin whom, on, the, on whose behalf he was acting. I read a lot of dictatorship around the world. I knew how they work. I suddenly felt that I was in a terrible danger at that night. In your opinion, who was Idi Amin in this context? Well, it has to be Yaya Jammeh because um, Malia Mugu, and what was funny as well, I should say that, because all the time that question was happening, Malia Mugu was always on the phone. He would interrupt the thing and go and come back. In my mind, he was in full uniform. Tumbul Tamba was there, who could have been his head, or his, his senior, perhaps. So if he was communicating at that night, going and coming, who was he communicating to? I had, I had conjectured all that that night. And I had a conclusion that he was being controlled. And everything that was happening that night, as I later find out, was being controlled from State House. Because my release, as I would tell you, come out from State House.
But at that time that he was on the leaving the room to speak on the phone, you cannot tell us for sure who he I, was I didn't know when he was talking. Well, he apparently didn't want that conversation to be had in that room. He was going and coming back. Could you describe his, um, his behavior, his demeanor to the person he was speaking to on the phone? Did you observe Whenever it Whenever the, the phone vibrates, because I think it, I've, never, I've never had it rang. It must have, it, it must have I had, I never had it ring. It must have been vibrate. He would go out, talk, and come back. Pick the phone, go, and come back. He did that many times during the parallel. He didn't say much. All, all what he said was, I told you this guy should be killed. Otherwise, he wouldn't say anything. And Muhammad Haider said, I should cooperate with them, otherwise these people will come back, meaning the torturers. I told Muhammad I didn't have any clues to what his questions are. I didn't know these games they are talking about. Until the next panel, that's when I, I, I don't know whether I had answered their right question or what. But well, they suddenly still, asked me to go to, to bed. Still focusing on that particular um, <coughs> interview by Mr. Haider, Deputy Director of NIA, Mr. Seka, Head of Operations, Malia Mungu, uh, Musa Jame, as well as Tumbul Tamba. You told us that the questions that you were being asked by Mr. Haidara were essentially similar to the ones that Tumbul Tamba had asked while you were being tortured. Is that correct? Exactly the same questions. And you told us that Mr. Haidara actually said, if you do not cooperate, then you would be sent back to he your He said, these men will come. I'll hand you, uh, these men will come back. That's what he said. It was better and in my own interest to cooperate with him. How long did that um, process take, the questioning um, in that office? That took around 20 minutes or so. Nuru Seka was not saying anything, but he was busy. He was writing down everything. He didn't say a word, but he was busy. He had volumes of papers in front of him, as well as Mohammed Hydra. Munuru was jotting down. He never said anything throughout the process. Even, in the next, even on the next day, he didn't say anything. But he Did was he busy Did he do writing. anything during that time? Pardon? Apart from, you told us he, that he didn't say anything. He, Nuru Seka didn't say a word, but he was very busy on the papers. He was writing. Apart from what he was writing down, did he do anything else during the time that you No, had? he didn't say a word throughout until after, when I was about to be released. That, that was the time he came and directly addressed me. But he could visibly see that you had been tortured of and course, he heard the words of that Of course, Mr. I came Hyder from the said. torture chambers, whatever the name is, they call it a ring there, and brought to the desk. So almost everybody in the room knew I was, I mean, they, they were part of the torturing process because he was saying I was going to go back there if I didn't cooperate. So everybody in the room knew I was tortured. And that was the process of the interview. There was no doubt. The torture was part of the process. After that, um, where were you taken? I was asked to go back to the reception. And like I said, when I got there, this woman, kind woman, Dutta Kamasa, was definitely devastated, uh, you know, with, with, with my looks. And she started helping me and, you know, praying. And the rest of the detainees, Lamin Fati, who was actually our imam there, um, was also consoling me. Malimbu told me, Cham, I have been here. I've seen worse things. They've even put gun, a gun in my mouth. Cham, you have to be here. I've been here for five months. So they kind of consoled me and uh, kind of calmed my nerves and made me comfortable a bit. But then, of course, I remained in terrific fear because knowing the type of people uh, who were in charge of this process, I, I knew, I felt that I was in terrible danger. And of course, uh, why I was in danger, because Tumbul had always said that they knew at the time the journalists who are responsible for sending out government secrets, that the, the most well-known among them was Ibrahim Asilla and me, and myself, Lamin Jam. He told me that. When did he say that? He said that during the torture. He said that. So at the time, Silla was not in the country, having fled, uh, I think, a year and a half earlier. So I, I came to this conclusion, these people had rated me very high in terms of their in terms of their consideration of being who is the enemy to the state. So I became terrified. Um, I knew, of course, I was rated very, very high among their enemies. So I spent the, the whole night in terrific fear of what may happen next. You told us that when you saw um, Mr. Malik Mboub, as well as Mr. Lamin Fati, you were surprised. Yes. Why were you surprised? Because I didn't know where they were there. Everybody knew, of course, they have been missing. And we all knew the, the usual suspects. 
I mean, there's, there exists no bandits or no bandit gang in this country. Whoever is picked up is take chance on, we know that. So I've always known that they've been kept somewhere, but I didn't know they were at the NIA there until that night when I saw them. You told us that uh, Mr. Mboop told you about how he was treated, including a gun being shoved. He told, he told me that, Sam, you have to be here. I have been through worse things. They even put a gun in my mouth. So you haven't seen anything. So when he said, considering that you had just been tortured and you were visibly injured, when he said, they've done worse things to me, you haven't seen anything else, what did you understand by that? Well, I, I understood. Having, experience, having just come out from the torture chambers, I knew, I believe him, that he, he, he really is speaking from experience. And maybe it was fit. I, wait, I, I was waiting for an even, an even uh, worse situation. It just continued to heighten my fears to the kind of situation I was at the time. Meaning he too, Mr. Moop, had been tortured at the NIA? Almost certainly. Uh, that has been told to me even, before, you know, even after his own just NIA staffs and for the, for, for, for other detainees told me. What about Mr. Fati? Mr. Fati had been taken away uh, three or so months prior to my uh, detention. Uh, actually, you know, I, I think that 2006 year was a year I would have you know, I was, I, 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 would, I was probably destined to be at the hands of Jammer because previous to my, uh, just shortly before my arrest, um, the independent got into trouble. Actually, when uh, Mr. Jalo, Baba Gale, um, left, uh, his wife, who was taking charge of the office, um, Mr. Jalo wanted to appoint me as um, uh, manager of the standard, of the, of the independent at the time. Uh, his wife approached me about it. I declined the offer because I knew that this, this independent was in fact at the time it was like the Daily Observer. It replaced the Daily Observer as number one top target for the for, for, for the government. So I kind of dragged my feet on that offer until the lady found out perhaps that I may not be interested or I'm a bit scared. Then there was a time they approached Mari Sise, who's now the National Assembly member for Serikuna West. Madi came up and became manager, and uh, immediately went into trouble with the authorities, along with Lamin Fati and some of his staff. Uh, they were arrested, tortured as well. <laughs> and then um, I avoided, perhaps I avoided uh, that the arrest, because if I were a manager, I would have been forced there. But when I went there and found what they went through, and Lamin was still there, I said, well, I mean, you know, I was, I knew, I was, I was going to be the, the man in place of Madi if I had taken the job, <laughs> you know. And I remember Mr. Jallo wrote to me from America and said, well, <laughs> you don't know how dictators work. You didn't escape me anyway. <laughs> so you see, uh, that was particularly very bad year. Uh, and Lavin had been there before me. He stayed there even longer. Even after I left, Malik and that Lavin <laughs> were still there. So you've told us that Lamin Fati worked for the Independent. Yes. What about um, Malik Mbou? Malik Mbou had been a, a, a news um, a reporter at our office at the Daily Observer. He left to work for the RBH. He apparently was suspected to be uh, either reporting or must have had uh, contact with uh, Pandirimbai because the whole episode was about freedom. So whether he was suspected to have been in be informing Pandir when he was at the Observer, or later after he left to be PRO at the hospital, I don't know. But then he was arrested and detained and tortured as a result of his suspected connection with freedom. So after this occurred, um, you were taken back to the room where you found these other journalists who had been missing for quite some time. Yeah. Um, you also told us that you met um, Madame um, Duto Kamas Kamaso. What else happened? Did anything else happen that night? Yeah, after you know, she took care of me and this uh, other detainees uh, comforted me. The next day, uh, they took me to hospital, a military hospital. And one four-day camera who was a driver, I think he's still there, he's the driver of, at the time he was a driver for one uh, Mr. Saw. Uh, I, cannot, I cannot remember which of the souls, because there are too many souls at the NIA at the time, and there are still a soul. Um, Usman Osamba Saw was, the, that person was the head of investigations at the time. Samba Saw or Usman Saw, I'm not sure which one. 
Did but you see this Mr. So at no, the NIA during that time? No, I have not seen time? this Mr. So with my eyes. But his driver was instructed to take me, and he told me that my boss said I should take you to the military hospital. That's just state guard. I used to call it state guard hospital next to the state house. I don't know whether that was out of generosity or a fourth attempt to conceal my wounds from, because I would have loved to go to the public hospital anyway. And I was not released after. I think they wanted to conceal my injuries for some time. Even when my friend came, I actually went twice, my friend came there and they were told that I was not there. One of them told them, look, this car right here, because my car uh, could be seen just, just as you enter. This car belonged to him. So if this guy here, he must be here. They said, no, I wasn't there. So he, when he eventually managed to find his way, he told me, Chama, I didn't expect you to be released now because the way you were looking, this will would allow you to go out. So I don't know whether that act of taking me to the State Guard Hospital was an act of generosity or was, was an attempt to conceal, to quickly get my wounds treated so that I, at least I would look a little better. Can you tell us what kind of um, medical treatment you received at the they were just, They just dressed my, um, my, my our bandages here, here, and my feet also. The guy cleaned, cleaned, cleaned my feet and put on bandages, and I was taken back to the NIA. I was driven by Ford a camera, like I said. He was a driver. On the instruction of his boss, who then was um, head of investigations. I saw whether it was Samba or Osman, I wasn't sure. Can you tell us what happened when you returned to the NIA? I stayed there. Nobody told me. Uh, two days later, Tumbul Tamba returned. That was another uh, very, very uh, terrific night for me because, you know, I was learning way the ways they walked uh, from people who have been there and from the books, etc. Uh, I was told that whenever they came for a detainee and they didn't enter the NIA, then there's bad news for that detainee. Meaning if the vehicles come from State House and did not enter, they just park and people come to pick that detainee, normally there's bad news for that detainee. So I was told that I knew about that. So all the night I, don't, I didn't sleep. I was waiting, where, what will come? What form will they come? Will they enter or will they stay outside? That was recall, always in my mind. Do you recall how many detainees were detained um, in the same place as you were at that time? A lot. Apart from these three, there were others there. There was a, a lamb in Bojang. Oh, I don't know, he was working at MRC. I heard his story. And there was a little boy, a, 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 a teenage. No, he not even a teenager. A very small boy. I heard about his story. He was brutally tortured there, too, all in connection with his freedom. Do you recall the name of this? I, I cannot remember. This, uh, um, his case was definitely very, very touching. He was a very small boy. I was told how he was horrendously tortured. Uh, and that was all. And there's this Lamin Bojang, who was also a staff of MRC, I remember. And that was a Buba Bojang. Uh, Buba Bojang is a, a soldier. I think he's still serving. He, he saw me. He saw me in those conditions. Uh, he was from Rikam, I think. Even now, when we meet, he, he, he cracked these jokes about what happened to me at that place. Buba Bojang, he too was detained in connection with this freedom thing. To focus on the little boy that you talked about, you said he wasn't even a teenager. He was. He couldn't have been more than ten. And you said from I what I saw him uh, after. I think that was after his torture when he was coming and going. I don't know to report or something. And I was told that he was brutally tortured. I cannot remember the name. I've, I spent years looking for that boy. And what kind of information did you hear about how he was tortured or what, what exactly happened? I think happened? the boy was uh, some sort of a computer wizard, somebody who was very, very much grounded in IT. And they suspected either he, he was communicating with uh, Pandey or was helping some people communicate or tried to help them access freedom or something like that. I didn't know what his suspected crimes were supposed to be, but I was told that he was tortured in very gruesome ways. And do you know who who was uh, who allegedly tortured him? Oh, the same gang, the same gang. I mean, apparently, the the panel that uh, interviewed us was it this was the panel that was set up after the March 2006 attempted coup led by Nur Chow. They had this joint panel of NIA police and state guards. So this was the panel. The panel apparently was not dissolved when the freedom case. Uh, came about. So that panel continued. So it's easy, it's easy to, to realize that that was the panel, the same methods that we are used, the Durcham, uh, Mart, Trit, Durcham, we are the same methods used to deal with the freedom. 
You've already mentioned the names of four individuals. Um, apart from these individuals, that is Tumbul Tamba, Musa Jame, Nuru Seka, and uh, Mr. Haidara, <coughs> did you recognize any of the um, members of the panel? The panel there was, uh, my name is Sheikh Laman Cham, a policeman from, uh, from um, Sukuta. That was Botoketa, of course, I know. Not in the panel at the time, but he was, you know, he was, he did the initial transportation to Banyul and other places. And then later they came, I mean, Cham, Abdullah Sise. I don't know what was his rank and what is his rank now because he's still serving. He was in the panel. What security outfit did he belong to? Uh, police. Lavin Cham. There was a Lavin Dao also. He was also police. Um, there was Lavin Cham. There was Border Keta. And there was this uh, Abdullah Sise, who appeared to be, in fact, I think, more senior among them. But later, I was, I was surprised myself because what happened was after my torture, I saw these policemen came themselves. Um, when they saw me, the first one who saw me actually appeared to be shocked when he looked at me. And I saw a couple of minutes later, they all came passing me, almost in single file, because this is not our place. They came almost in single file, and everybody was glancing. I was looking at my face. I knew they were probably either shocked or, or not happy with what happened to me. And later, much later, I heard that the police abandoned that panel in protest. Principally in protest at what happened to me, because they saw that glaringly. That's what I learned from what happened. But was this clearly, I saw them when they weren't happy. Their faces weren't looking good when they saw me. They appeared to be shocked. When they saw you, was it after the first time you were tortured? After or was the first it torture, they, they came. And the first one who saw me went, and then I saw them coming, and they were all looking at me. They passed. And just to be clear, these police officers were not part of the, um, no, the police people who interviewed you? No, they were not part of the torture. And they appeared to be clearly and visibly shocked when they saw my look on the morning of my torture. And I later learned that because of that, they eventually uh, moved out of that panel in protest uh, to what happened to me. Where, uh, who did you hear that from, do you recall? Uh, I followed him closely after, the, after the, this thing, uh, after my release. Uh, you know, after my release, I was reporting there until they told me that if I was needed, I would come, I would be called. I was following the story very because I always wanted to write this story and have a way of saying it. So I was following them. I interviewed police uh, anonymously, and they told me that uh, that's what happened. Your case, they told me, actually um, was the last throw for us because we never wanted to be part of this torture process, but your case actually was what made us say, well, look, we had enough, we're not going to be part of this panel. The senior policeman told me that. So we've already discussed what happened to you the first time you were tortured. You said two days later they came back for you. Can when you tell Tumbul us about came, that? He was, this time he was very much in a hurry. I don't know where he was going. Uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't enter the place with the car. But I, like I told you before, I, I had this story that if they didn't enter, that would that's be bad news for any detainee they came for. So when he came and there wasn't any vehicle, well, you could imagine how I felt that day. But Tumbul seemed to be very much in a hurry. He just came and followed by two, three men. They went behind the ring, and then he said, "I was going to give you a final, a final, a final uh, chance." You know, even before he said anything, they started beating again. Then was sorry. Um, was Musa Jame present? No, that time he was not. So it was Tumbul and three individuals. Yes. yes. And you can you describe how they were dressed? They were like they were in this kind of. I did the, 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 the gang was not as large as the previous one, and Tumbul said he was giving me a last touch, and they started beating. Oh, it didn't last long this much, and I was ushered into this room where these two men were, Hydra and Seka again. Before that, yeah. the three individuals who were beating you, what were they using to beat you? Again, whips and stumps. They were using their fist most of the time, much of the time. Did um, Tumbul Tamba himself participate in the beating on N that occasion? No, he kept asking the same question, and he, he warned me that was the last time, final time, then the final chance. You told us that it didn't last for long. Do you recall yes. how long that torture um, lasted? Not as long as the previous one, maybe 10 minutes or something. Then I was ushered into this room, and uh, I think Tumul was in a very much in a hurry that night. He didn't stay long. And this Saho, uh, this Hydra and Nuru Seka repeated the same questions. Was it in the same room as this, the this, previous? Yes, the same room. 
And do you recall where that room is located in the, in the it building? It is somewhere in the, uh, below it, um, the, the story building that was, uh, when you enter the, I mean, uh, NIA, that's the building you really look right in front of you. Uh, the place has been changed, obviously, now, uh, but that was the first building you see, somewhere on there, uh, maybe the first floor, so that's where the thing happened. You've the already told us about the injuries you suffered after the first time you were tortured. Can you tell us um, if you suffered any injuries after the second time, the second incident of torture? Uh, of course, there was the head. The, I mean, the, the second one, I, 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 I think I received knocks more on the head than anywhere. And when I came to the room, uh, there were a lot of gadgets. I don't know where, where they got that. Shit. I was pretty scared. I thought perhaps there were going to be more gadgets used on me or something, but they didn't do that. What kind of gadgets are you uh, they had to? They had cables or something like that. I cannot make out what was that. Whether they were recording as well to wear recording materials or filming, I don't know. But there were gadgets there. I thought that, they were, that those were going to be used on me, but they didn't do that. In fact, they seemed to be in a hurry that day because after two or three questions, um, I mean, Hydra put down his uh, things and said, Jam, you can go to sleep. And I went to sleep. I was never tortured again. But during that meeting, what was Mr. Nuruseka's role in that Nuru was, like interview? I said, never said anything. He was busy writing. Hydra was apparently the head of the investigations in that room. And probably even alongside um, the torturers, because apparently it was, it's always from here, from the torture chambers to his office. And he he's apparently, he was a pan, mass person in charge of questions. The line of questions all came from him. Can you tell us what happened after you, um, after that? I was asked to go and sleep. I went back to the reception. Uh, this following day, um, Nuru Seka, this is the first time he came to directly address me. He said, well, I'm going to write a report about you. But this has to be after Friday prayers. Because these people, meaning people at State House, will only look after this after, state, after Friday prayers. So you could see all my suspicions were confirmed that all these things are orchestrated from State House. And what he said is exactly what happened after Friday prayers. What he came to me and said, go and get somebody who will, uh, who, with an ID card, who will come to bail you. I called Abdul Salam, I, when I didn't get him, I called Al-Kali Jajus, he was my neighbor. Al-Kali Jajus, he came and used his ID card. And that was how I left. I was told to come every day. I was going every day. Each time I arrive, before I go in there, I go to a, a nearby um, phone booth and call the British High Commission. So I'm coming to report. I'm going to report. And after, immediately I leave, I left, I will call them back now. I'm safe, I've just left there. It went on like that until they told me now, if you are needed, you will come. But then, uh, my, what Tumbul Tamar has told me was that myself and Ibrahim Asila were the people, they were told, are the principal agents of taking information sensitive or secret about the government overseas. That if I should come back, if I should make the mistake to invite it back there, and that would not be good news. And so why would I report? He threatened you. Pardon? Essentially, he threatened you. Yes, and why would I report without mentioning Jammes name? So obviously, I knew that it was too dangerous to operate as an independent journalist because it was. I mean, those people. If those people are the people who are going to determine or assess what the content of a news report is, then we are in trouble because they, they are looking only for Jammes name, whatever context. So meaning they don't have the capacity to be able to, or the knowledge to be able to assess whether in fact a report is inaccurate or whether it is fair or balanced. All what they did, if you mentioned Jamme, you are in trouble. That's what he told me. Why couldn't I report without mentioning Jamme? Before you proceed, I want to ask a couple of questions. Yeah. On the first occasion, you said it was clear that Mr. Haidara, the deputy director, and Mr. Nuruseka, head of operations, knew that you had been tortured. Of course, they were there. What they about were, the second occasion? They were there. They knew that. Because I was from the church chambers to come to, come to them, and Tumbul was talking to them. Whenever Tumbul come, came to their place, he, he will be the first point of contact. He would talk to them, and then they come to us. So they definitely were working in tandem with Tumbul in, 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 during the entire process. 
There's no doubt about it. There was no doubt about it. You told us that you, from everything that you heard, including your conversation with Mr. Nuruseka, you knew that the entire process was being orchestrated from State House. He told me I was going to, he was to write a report, but I should sit and wait and expect it to be only re reactions from that report or whatever will follow, only after Friday press. This must be Friday the 4th June. Uh, 2006. Only after that would he get, would he got, would he receive an outcome, and that's exactly what happened. So you were in detention for about five days. About that. During that time, were you taken out of um, detention apart from the instance when you were taken to the military <laughs> yes. clinic? Yes, I was even made to be part of a police operation. Like I told you the last time, at the time of the torture, I didn't know the connection. Uh, between Panderi and Omarba. Now, I was put in a car, um, which was in fact the lead car at the time, and we were driven to Bunno. Apparently, they knew the, the general direction of Omar's house. I myself didn't know personally Omarba's exact address, but I knew that that was where I used to drop him whenever we closed from work, midnight plus, I would, I would, I would drive uh, all the night staff and I would drop Omar at that place. I didn't know the exact. So apparently the police and whoever they are knew his, the, the, the direction where he lived. So I was made to sit in a car with a policeman while they went all around that place. So I knew they were looking for Omar Ba. They asked me his, they, they asked me what was his description. Was, you know the black teen man who used to limp. They got all that information. That was all correct about him. Do I know any address where he lives apart from that place? No, I don't even know this correct address where he lives. And later in the evening, I had a public announcement that Omar was wanted, that whoever lodged him would be himself or herself in trouble. So, so I began to piece things together. That, okay, my case probably is linked with Omar. And when they came to ask about Omar, I knew that perhaps, you know, uh, our cases were linked. So I was in the police operation trying to locate Omar. In the span of those... And then, of course, I was also escorted to my house. Uh, they, were, they were looking for papers. They came to my house and ransacked my cupboard. There were only pictures of GFA football leagues and so many other things. They looked at them, and then they said we could go. We went back. Did you um, freely allow the police access to your home in order to conduct that search? I didn't have any option. They said we are going to your house. I said, okay, let's go. Did they present you with a search warrant no. for the search of your house? They did not. I was not given any option. I was said, told that I will be going home. I said, let's go. So we went. The police operation regarding um, Mr. Omar Ba's residence in Bundung and the operation regarding um, your house, um, the search of your house, did that happen on the same day at the same time? No, oh, the following day. Omar was the same day. Uh, the, the way of God, but it, the mine was the following day. Because actually they were... After that, after my house, they brought me to, to a room where they went through my email address. They asked me to, uh, I mean, open my email. I did that. And they went through. Even the mails I trust or I thought have been deleted. I don't know how they were able to bring them back. But they showed me emails. Because I knew at a time that I have never, never in my life you know, written to or communicated with Pandere. So I was very sure that if they were looking for evidence of that nature, it was in there. So I was very confident. And they did, they had a form too, um, where they were marking, uh, I mean, I guess correct means maybe that one is, that one is clear. So there was an internet for, um, email post on that they marked correct, just after that. And when I look back, I saw Duda Kamazo too also in the queue. I'm, I, I, it must have been when I left that C2 was put uh, to, to open her mail or whatever. It was at the same time. They had a form also, they wanted people to say which uh, political parties they, they voted for. Uh, they wanted that. Uh, I, I, at the time, I, I, the last time I voted was 97. I remember uh, Malik Mbu was there. He was always a jovial man. He said, Cham, are you entering APRC just for them to leave you? <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. And said, uh, he said, OK, do whatever you like. So I ticked. Uh, I didn't vote. I didn't know what I ticked. I can't remember. I didn't vote uh, for years before that. 97 was the last time I voted. They had that form. I asked you which political affiliation I, I, I had at the time. 
Apart from your political affiliation, what other types of questions were you asked? Uh, where I come from. They, they first ask, where did I come from? Where was I born? What ethnic group was I? They ask all those questions. So in the span of the five days, can you locate for us when those um, police operations occurred? Was it after a day or two? I think the second day of my arrest was the day, uh, it was suddenly before my torture that, that we went for Omar, that I was made to be part of the police operation searching for Omar, and then to my house. When I was going to my house, I wasn't tortured. So those were immediately the day I was checking, or the day before the tortures. After the torture, I was not let out, only to the, military, uh, to the um, State Guard Hospital and back. You told us about your release, the context of it, and thereafter you were told to report every day. Yeah. Where were you reporting to? At the NIA. At the NIA. Yeah. There was a show there. I told you there are many shows at the NIA at the time. I, there are still shows, I think. I don't know which of the shows, but there's this fair-colored one who was, in fact, the one giving us food at the time. So it was to him that we were reporting. That's different from the show whose driver took me to the... Uh, uh, to, the, to the State Guard Hospital. And you said the Saul whose driver took you to the State Guard Hospital was the head of... Was um, the head of... of investigations, investigations at the time. I didn't know his first name. He could... Is he either an Usman or a Samba? Do you know um, where that Saul is presently? What no. is his current position? I didn't see any of the Saul. The only Saul I saw there is still there. That was the guy who was giving us uh, food and he was the one always with us. Uh, that's still there. That Saul is still there. He's not Usman. Is he's there. I think he, at some point, I, I learned from the news that he too got into trouble with the system and was detained and sacked, and I think he's reinstated. Yeah, that was the show who, who, would I, who I would say was the one with us all the time. And it was to him we were reporting uh, after my release, until I was asked by him. Uh, my, the guy who came with his ID card to bail me said he signed my bail at the office of a saw. I, can't, I don't know which saw is that. He said that was a saw whose office I signed your bill. I don't know which saw is this. You told us that the reporting at the NIA was every day. Do you yeah. recall for how long? It was well lasted? over a month. Well over a month because shortly after my release, I think three weeks after the African Union summit took place, and I remember when I was uh, going to the AU, I used to go to report first and then go to, uh, to the AU to check uh, Preparations at the time. I was doing a story on the preparations, etc. So it took more than a month. In terms of the members who were part of the torture operation, do you know where Tumbul Tamba is presently? When I was in London, I heard he died. He, along with um, uh, Tumbul Tamba, to, uh, I, Tumbul Tamba and Malia Mugu, I had they both died. Do you know under which circumstances they died? Um, I didn't know, but there was this strange news that uh, one of them was actually beginning to tell stories about how he might have been involved in torture or killing of people. I had that story. I don't know how true was that. And there were even suspicions uh, that probably they could have been, well, like children of any revolution, they might have been eaten by the revolution itself. I'm not sure about that, but they died. Both of them die are dead now. What about um, Mr. Nuru Seka? Do you know where he is presently? In fact, I saw Nuru Seka five days, is it five days ago, last Wednesday, when the SIS uh, hosted an international conference of intelligence chiefs of West Africa. I saw him there. I've not seen him in 10 years, but I saw him there. So he's serving. Do you know his current position? No, I don't know. He must be senior because at the time of our torture, he was operations. So if he were to go back, he probably would be that or above that. What about uh, Mr. Haider, who I've was never deputy seen him. director? I've never NIA. seen him since I walked out of the NIA in June 2006. Can you tell us um, what happened to you after you were released? You said you reported for about a month. Did you stay in the country thereafter? Yeah, the, the effect was devastating on me because for the first time I was afraid to walk in my country. And I knew what happened to me, the people who are supposed to be watching what journalists do or say or report are not the people competent to judge journalists. I knew everybody who's a journalist would be in trouble. In the, who wants to work independently would be in trouble 
in this country. The only course open for me was to leave the country. And I was so devastated, I lost the job. Because in fact, I was no need for me to go out of the country. I was a BBC correspondent, which had better pay than any local job you can do in the media here. But I knew that I was more dangerous. I have been I marked. It was impossible to walk when those people are in power. So I had to leave the country. I suffered a great deal. My family suffered a great deal. I went to London. Uh, some friends helped me to do a crash course in, uh, the, uh, at L uh, London School of Journalism, and, uh, leading to an advanced diploma. I flew to Dakar to continue my, uh, my, my exile. Um, Dakar, of course, a Francophone country. Uh, I would say some of the Gambian exiled journalists who were there before picked up all the English language jobs. It wasn't possible to work there. So that my suffering just continued. I lost income, self-dignity. I, I mean, I was very well known all around. I'd made all over the Gambia. Suddenly, I was made an enemy of the state. Nobody in the history system would like to talk to me for long. People told me your telephone will be tapped as long as this case lasts. I was completely devastated. For the first time, I walked like, I, I looked like I was not a loving charm who used to be admired by everybody. I knew I could not walk normally now. In this process. And I feared for the profession because knowing the kind of people who are supposed to watch us, um, I knew this, this, this country would be terrible for journalists to work under. And at the time, you mentioned that your family suffered terribly. Did you have children at that time? Yeah, I had children who were very young. At the time, my second was uh, Usman, who was just one year, a little over a month. I was taking, um, but then I had a lot of dependents. I, I come from a family where my brother had a lot of. Uh, brothers and all their children, I was trying as much as possible to look after them. Everybody was devastated. Um, everybody feared for my, li for my life, like my own, my safety in the country. Um, I, I sometimes acted stupid. I, 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 I com became a completely different person. Who, the person who have never known you know, that kind of situation, I was put in that situation. And all that was through fear. And how much time did you spend essentially in exile? before returning to the country? It must have been well over five years, because I, like I said, the rest of it was spent in Dakar, Senegal. When did you finally return to the Gambia? It must be in the mid of 2012. 2012? Yeah, I think around that, or late 2011. It was certainly after the 2011 election, so it was early, it was early 2012, yeah. Looking at your present circumstances today, what would you say are the residual effects that these incidents, meaning the torture, the fear, having to go into exile, what impact has that, does that continue to have on you? Well, I told you, now I've picked up a little bit, but I, I definitely am a completely different man. Um, uh, you know, I, I used to be very confident in what I do. I, I like I said, I was very much uh, respected and seemed to be the light of a right thinking somebody. I was criminalized when I was um, detained and tortured. I don't think I have psychologically, even even in terms of resources, I have not recovered. Uh, yeah, I haven't recovered. I'm still a broken, a broken man from that experience. Mr. Cham, thank you very much for answering my questions. I have come to the end. I will hand over the floor to Mr. the Chairman so that the Commissioners may ask further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Council, and thank you, Mr. Cham, for your testimony. Um, our commissioners, maybe you have um, questions to ask. Before that, I have one quick question. What role did the Gambia Press Union play uh, during your arrest and the detention? Yes, um, I remember at a time um, um, I was, uh, I, would, I didn't receive uh, financial um, support, but I, I actually received a lot of solidarity from the Gambia President uh, about what happened to me. So I didn't receive financial support or anything, but I, 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 I mean, the people who knew what happened to me uh, were concerned, and, and I think they have, they have written to the human rights African Commission of Human Rights here, and my case was forwarded to them. They, told, they themselves told me that the GP had been talking about me. So I commend them. And uh, when I went outside also, um, whenever I wanted reference, the GP will always uh, you know, quickly send me attestations 
uh, to ex say exactly what happened to me. So that's, I received a lot of solidarity from them. They were not in the financial position, of course, to help me, but what I expected was moral support, and I got that. Thank you. Commissioner Nassim, you have any questions? Anyone? Uh, Commissioner Carr, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, you said there was a certain army PRO who wasn't happy with Deda's work, but I didn't hear you mention his name. Do you remember him? Yes. Um, shortly before Deda's uh, uh, murder, there was a press conference organized by the army. Uh, Bunja Dabo was PRO. That conference, press conference, was very critical of uh, the Point newspaper. And uh, the Point, of course, was Deda's paper. So that was just prelude. That was just uh, unfortunate prelude to his murder. So there was a lot of animosity you could see from, from, from the security people. And, and of course, um, um, when it also happened at a time when the independent newspaper um, was attacked and burnt. Um, while they were assaulting the paper, one of the people involved dropped a gun. Now, this gun got, at the point, got, to, got the story, and I remember the photograph of this gun was printed in the front page of the point, and even some analysis made that suggesting that it could only have come from the army. That is what incurred the wrath of the army and prompted that press conference, and they were very hostile to the point. It was not long after that, they had died, was killed. If there were other motives that was built up along the years, because generally everybody was operating on a difficult climate, but then it happened shortly after that. So this tells you how I felt that, I, personally I felt that, look, I, come on, this, this could only have been state sanction, because, I mean, the, it couldn't be coincidental that they were, you know, they were, you know, they were up in arms against the point, and, and later, after that we said, then I die. I had my personal feeling that something is definitely going to, it's very serious has happened. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ma'am Jalo, you have the floor, please. Um, Mr. Chan. Yeah. You have described very clearly what all that happened to you. Now, can you tell us if there are any more repressive laws that are detrimental to the progress of, of journalists in the Gambia? Yes, well, to be fair, when this new government came to power, um, they have done a lot in removing lot, most of the obstacles that were, in, were put in place by the Jammer regime. But there are still concerns, as you said, indicated by the GPU. They're challenging laws of uh, deformation, sedition, etc. Not all that is completely out. I think some aspects of it are still being challenged in the courts. And I think the only way now for this government to do is to do away as soon as possible uh, those laws and restrictions that impede the work of the media. I'm quite sure that we probably will never get to the to the days when journalists have to be killed, tortured, or imprisoned just because of what they've written. I know we're not going to go back there. But there is always a risk that as long as there exist loopholes that the powers that be can exploit, there is a risk that they will come back to it and exploit it to curtail freedom of expression. Remember I told you journalists are communication agents. If somebody's not happy with what has been said about him or her, it targets the, those communication agents to muscle them, stifle them, or as it happened in few cases on the Jammy, to kill them. So if there are such loopholes there, we want them all removed. We want unfettered access to information and disseminating it in the interest of the public. There should be no restrictions. Even though the government have done very well, I think there are still issues that still need to be completely dealt with. Mr. Chair, uh, yeah. uh, just to point of order, to the yes, right? yes, just to assist uh, the uh, Commissioner Jalo to indicate that uh, the GPU is going to speak to this particular issue, uh, and when the next witness arrives, 
he would talk about the repressive laws, the steps that have been taken to amend them, what is left in the books, and what they uh, expect should happen in the not too distant future. So, so if there are any gray areas, I think this would be clarified when the next witness testifies. Thank you. Thank you for that guidance. And uh, Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Lamin Cham. Yes, sir. Mr. Kenneth Y. Bess was the founder and proprietor of the yes. Daily Observer newspaper in the Gambia. He came here as a refugee mm -hmm. from Liberia. And uh, he was deported back to where he was running from. Um, uh, can you tell us whether he actually went directly to Liberia or, was, or did he go to another country? I thought, I think he definitely went to Liberia first because at the time, uh, all what the John understood his uh, origin to be was Liberia. And the planes that were going out of Banjul, <laughs> there was no direct flight to America. I believe, in fact, I remember the plane was a Bellevue airline. I could be mistaken, ADC or Bellevue, and I was going to either Monrovia, Freetown, Monrovia, and along the other coast. So I think Mr. Best first port of call when he was bundled out uh, in November 94 was in Liberia, where he actually ran away from. Thank you. Uh, my second question, actually, um, you did mention that um, in May 1999, uh, the Daily Observer was sold to Mr. Amadou Samba. Um, uh, uh, did you know um, whether Mr. Betts was compensated for uh, the Daily Observer that he actually founded and owned, uh, which was sold to somebody else? Are you saying whether he was the one who actually sell the paper or you, you are suggesting it was taken from him without any monetary? No, 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 I'm not suggesting that. Okay. Um, according to what you have um, said here, that in May 1999, yeah. the newspaper was sold yeah. to Mr. Amadou Samba. Yes. So I just want to know, mm -hmm. um, because when the man was deported. Yes. So, who sold the newspaper? Okay. Now, now, from November 94, right down to May 99, the paper was still owned by Mr. Best. He appointed Tearfulness George as managing director and asked the management to recruit more journalists and continue to work. But sometime along the way, I think, I never spoken to Mr. Best, he felt perhaps he wasn't happy with either one, the monetary aspect of it, or the operations, he decided to sell it. I knew he sold it because a letter came from him that was pasted on the board, announcing that from now on, let all staff uh, be informed that the observer is now owned by Amadou Sam. I saw that with my own eyes in May 1999. So there's no point that it was Mr. Best who sold it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Imam C, you have the floor. Mr. Chow. Mr. Chow. How are you? Well, my last man. What I want to ask is that. freedom, you don't. What was happening here was that the government they refuse to give, give opposition opposition to report opposition or anything to the government. They want to be revealed. 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 They want to be reveal
légui na lo taxna légui journalistes yu bari légui bayi nañ ci bind da lepp lo xamné dafa ngañna nguur gi muy joggé ci opposition wala mu joggé ci lenen wala képp ko xamné dafa am deneen xalaat lu uté ak mu guur dem buguñ ko fi lolu motax ñi nga xamné journalistes lañ té daw nañ dem america wala angleterre ñoo ñu dañ continuer ci journalism Mr. Defar... Cham, sorry to interrupt. Can you just slow down so ah, the okay. interpretation can follow? So you defer a uh, newspaper you have on the internet. Uh, la they created a newspaper which is on the internet. Nga have the bobu. Which you know that will be. Can do that mona jot fu nega. No one will uh, lay hand on that one. Li nga have the def day have fi te ngour gi bugut mu feñ fi. This happening here and government don want it that it, that uh, information to be revealed. Ñom dañ ko bind fa lañ ni ñangi fi di They will write it over there then people will lolu di xam lan mo xew ci dekkam. And they will know what is happening in the country. Ah deme na ba watu bo xamne sax ñi nekk ñi nekk ci bitim rew ñoo de gëna xam sax lan mo xew. They will know what is happening in the country and ñi fi dekkam ñu ko day xam. Lolu ak lo xamne ay secret la that is secrecy ngor bi bugut ken xam ko fi government don want uh, other some people to know it lu bari ay affaire human many rights violations about bari human bari right bari. violations and any, so, many other things it you mainly freedom newspaper you you think paper, paper, papers just like freedom, freedom paper fenya. they don't they bari la won way ci gena fey ngor gi genona bañ but people, the former government they, what they don't want moy freedom newspaper that is freedom newspaper so ad bobu nak ko ni mako waxe that you as i said ñu deg deg ne ki nga xamne mo yore freedom te def ko dey bind person who owns freedom newspaper on how how nak lañ duggé ci compte am email am i don't know i don't know how do they uh, able to penetrate on to get into the email dañ fa jël xibar bo xamne dafa am ay nit ñi fi nekk ño xamne ño dey jox jox lan te am mo there are people who you normally feed him on informations legi ñu o ñoñu yëpp ci police station they call all of them at the police station he said kan mo de jogalante ak ci 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 lolu nak give him information tik 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 bes yoyu nak ngeen commencer di duñu du xatal nit ñi di doon nit ñi the time they started pressing people torturing people kan mo de joxe information to know who he normally give him uh, give them give that person information that was the thing um thank you very much um one very brief um, a question for you from me before we proceed to you making final remarks and if you have any to make um how just if you can expound a little bit on uh, the fear that um, really was put in you when either tumbul tamba or musa jame kept on repeating i guess uh, not one day but several days that kill this man i told you to kill this man he won't he won't talk how did you cope with that fear well like i said that, that was really a, a very terrific moment for me because uh, i like i told you i knew malia mugo from his reputation being a very vicious man and i i like i told you i read a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, types of dictatorships all around even in the region i know about idi amin about samuel do Uh, about a uh, lot of uh, regimes that really violate the human rights of the people uh, if malia mugu had that nickname and that, and Michael, that nickname came from his own colleagues soldiers they gave him that nickname and it didn't come just as just any other nickname it came he earned a reputation so when he told me that the only thing he told the panel that the only thing in mandinga i told you from the beginning that the only way to get this man talking is to kill him he, he said that in plain mandinga i was terrifically scared because i knew from reputation he was capable of doing that i had told earlier that i had that i was killed so and 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 the fact that i was painted in a picture that really suggested that i was probably among the most you know wanted or hated figure in the media at the time but they mentioned Ibrahim and me i knew the malia mugu may probably be very serious and he may meant what he said so i was terrifically feared when he said i should have been killed uh, i would have been killed right away because he knew i wouldn't talk i was pretty scared and continue to be even after i left the place and he made it clear that if i ever gave them a cause or reason to come back uh, i mean that would be a different story Thank you very much and if you have any concluding remarks to make please proceed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um 
All I have to say is um, I think this process is a very good process. From the beginning when this uh, TRRC was talked about, I felt that uh, here was an opportunity now for Ross to talk to the people of the Gambia about what journalists and journalism had gone through over the last 22 years. I've already said that our profession and professionals were the people who suffered the most on the Jambe. Because apparently, Jambe's mode of operandi was he was going to be the Lord and nobody else was going to have a, a different opinion. And the only means of getting different opinion or opinions divergent or um, opposing his side is through the press. So he directly targeted the press for oppression using all sort of methods he had, including killing her. So when we had gone through that situation, and now that we have come from a new era, I think it is incumbent upon the new leadership to ensure that never again the journalists or any other person be subjected to this kind of operations when they are doing their work. I know it will be very difficult now, in fact, for journalism, for journalists themselves um, to leave a uh, guard in protecting their freedoms. It, it will be very difficult to intimidate journalists now. But like I said, it is incumbent upon the establishment to pursue and formulate policies that will ensure that none of this type is repeated. No other love and charm will be sent to Jammes or to the gallows or to, to the NIA to be tortured. Or no other data hider will be shot in the street. Or Chief Mane will be disappeared without trace up to now. Or Omar Barrow will be shot at point blank. Or dozens of others will have to leave their country to go to exile. That's what had happened to the journalist profession. And I still stand to be correct, but I think journalists suffer the most. It went up to a point that people used to leave this country and go and claim asylum under the pretext that they were, false pretext that they were journalists. Just because it was international knowledge that journalists were really under oppression in the Gambia. I am a journalist. I've been around is even after the change. And I've been talking to people. And when I say people, I mean people of right thinking opinion. And what I get is that at the moment they are disappointed that the principles that, inst that, that really motivated the whole country to come together and push for a change, those principles are gradually being abandoned. I know this because I talk to people, I listen to people. My job is to listen to people, read the reporters, uh, analyze what they've got, what the people tell them. And generally, people are getting disappointed that the establishment is not pursuing or implementing the policies and principles that will inspire the people to be in a different Gambia. Some would say, in fact, the evil forces that actually connive or perpetrated these atrocities against people are still very much alive. And they found the establishment to be either vulnerable or weak and easily manipulate, manipulate. In that face, they can easily manipulate them. Even the evil forces that Jambi himself despised are now busy to get themselves relevant. And if we continue like that, in no time we'll go back to ground zero. And I think this would be a message that should sink down to everybody. That the people, and I said right thinking people, who doesn't necessarily belong to any political parties, who were here on July the 21st, 1994, and they knew the Gambia without any tribalism, the Gambia with set rules and regulations, the Gambia where everyone was one, they are here. They tell us that they are disappointed that we are gradually going back to the period before 94 to now. And my last message, of course, would be uh, that I must thank the people, my, my colleagues in the profession, for standing their ground 
and whether all the atrocities, animosities, and hostilities that they encountered during the Jammer regime, and they still are committed to upholding the principles of journalism and freedom of expression. I thank them all. I thank the whole nation for believing in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman, Mr. Jammer, uh, for your testimony. Mr. Champ. Sorry, Mr. Champ. My apologies. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are not a Musa Jame. I, I know an incarnation of that. But thank you very much, Mr. Cham, and uh, sorry for that slip, uh, for the testimony and for the very wise words that you just um, spoke. I hope, um, uh, and I uh, have no doubt it would assist us in uh, making our recommendations on doing what, what should be done to prevent a repeat of um, uh, what happened in this country for 22 years. But thank you so much, Emma, for agreeing to come to uh, the Commission and uh, testifying Emma, before us. Council, we would take a break um, unless you want to have a witness come in before the, uh, the 1.30 break. I, Otherwise, I we will resume. Cold, yeah, yeah, Jeremy, so you <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so, we would um, uh, take a break and then come back at half past two. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.